Uh, yeah, thank you. So as you've heard, uh, I'm not a physicist, I'm a computer scientist. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on the way in which computational methods, particularly from artificial intelligence uh, and big data, uh, are able to impact on the way in which we do scientific research. Uh, I'll mention some physics examples, but there'll be lots of others. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of history. Uh, and it perhaps starts in the 1930s with an argument over a cup of tea uh, in which one scientist claimed that she could tell whether the milk had been put in the cup first or added to the tea afterwards. Uh, and her colleague, Mr. Fisher, said this was nonsense. So they devised a number of experiments and worked out a statistical test for analysing the results. Uh, it turns out she could tell the difference. Um, but more importantly, it went on to Fisher developing many of the major methods for statistical analysis that gets used in research, um, primarily in areas like biology and psychology. Um, and it's probably in biology where the biggest gains early on were made in um, big data analysis. That didn't do anything. There. Yeah. Um, through bioinformatics. Once we learnt how to sequence DNA to understand the, uh, the genomes of lots of different species, we suddenly got lots and lots of data that, frankly, we didn't know what to do with. So lots of these statistical methods got used into analysing the patterns that you find in DNA, the, prote the proteins that they produce in their interactions. The graph at the top there comes from this uh, paper. The black line is the amount of DNA data that we've produced so far, and then there are a number of projections following that. Uh, and in fact, the point of the paper is to show that the amount of data that we're getting out of gene sequencing is soon going to exceed the amount of computational storage that we have in the world, um, which is something of a problem. Um, it's a problem that's also being faced by particle physicists, and we'll return to that uh, later on. Another interesting area that was developing big data in the 90s was social science. And that's a, a textbook from 1995, Social Network Analysis, where sociologists were interested in the networks that people form in society. So the, the famous example is the Kevin Bacon game. Um, you associate two actors if they've starred in the same movie. Uh, and then the game was, given your favorite movie star, what's the shortest path to get to Kevin Bacon? Um, it's for this reason he now advertises mobile phone networks. Um, mathematicians came up with their own version of this to do with who you co-authored with. It was, it was much geekier and less fun. And then a third area that has kind of only come out recently that this was, was going on, in which uh, big data analytics and statistical analysis of experiments was, was really breaking ground, was in... Um, yeah was in studies of the paranormal. So this is, this is not an episode of the X-Files. This is a genuine CIA report that got declassified two years ago. Um, it's called An Assessment of the Evidence for Psychic Functioning. Uh, it pulls together evidence from multiple experiments throughout the 90s. The author concludes that there are a small percentage of us that have genuine psychic powers. This is the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, it spawned some follow-up work, as you can imagine. Uh, so here's a more recent article. And it's asking a really important question that's going to have ramifications in physics. What happens when you combine evidence from many different experiments that maybe have been run under slightly different assumptions? Does that introduce some kind of bias or, or questionable results into the outcome? Um, and so that's a very interesting follow-up that happened to that. Uh, work in big data then took a left turn and was mostly driven by the advertising industry uh, in the form of Google and then Facebook. Um, they've put lots of money into research in big data aimed at providing you with the most appropriate advert whenever you look at one of their web pages. Uh, and you can see here the annual revenue in billions of dollars over the last 10 years. It goes up to about 200 billion last year puts funding for fundamental science into perspective, I think. Um, and almost all of this revenue for Google and Facebook comes from advertising. 
It has been alleged that Facebook makes money on using their data for other purposes, um, but we won't go into that. Let me talk about some of the technological breakthroughs that uh, have happened recently that have led to, to some, of these, um, some of these advances. The first and probably the biggest one is the invention of the um, deep convolutional neural network. Um, ImageNet, which this paper is about, is a very big database which has lots and lots of images. You can get it online. Uh, and the important thing is that the images are all labeled. It says what objects are in the images. And the challenge was, can you come up with a machine learning algorithm that can be trained on that data set and then learn to recognize objects in pictures? This was thought to be, and it was, a very, very difficult problem. The deep convolutional neural network was the way to solve it. But it wasn't just the fact that this convolutional network was a clever algorithm. It relies very much on the fact that you've got lots and lots of labeled data, and you've got lots and lots of computer power to do it, but it enables us now to do things that 10 years previously we could never have dreamt of. Um, so the algorithm can now just take a photo, perhaps not even a good photo, and tell you this is a mite, this is a container ship, this is a motor scooter, this is a leopard. Um, you can download these classifiers onto your phone and just take a picture of something with your phone and it'll tell you what objects are in the picture you've taken. Um, you can also seg segment pictures or movies, detect the objects, track them as they move around. Um, it's completely amazing. This is a real breakthrough in artificial intelligence. Another one which you've probably heard of, um, using multiple, uh, or lots and lots of computer power and data and learning, this time a reinforcement learning algorithm, was to play the game Go. Um, it was again thought for a long time that this would be pretty much impossible for computers to crack. Uh, DeepMind, which is now part of Google, uh, managed to produce their AlphaGo player, which was as good as human experts. The next technological breakthrough, which is really important, is called transfer learning. The problem with the, uh, the ImageNet challenge is it needed all this data that was very, very carefully labeled, and of course that took lots of time for people to do the labeling. Um, so what you do in transfer learning is you have some of this labeled data, which you train your neural network on, and then you try and transfer as much of the architecture of that network as possible into another domain where you haven't got nice labels. And it turns out this is a really neat idea when you can get it to work. And this enables us to do actually some quite good scientific classification. So I'll show you one example here. Um, this was a paper that did um, looking at images from electron microscopes at uh, the nanoscale. And these are very, very complicated things. Humans looking at many of these things just wouldn't know what they were, so they wouldn't be able to label them. So you can train it on a small set of things where humans do know what they are. That gets you the features that the network's going to use, and then you can apply it to develop classification algorithms for these nanoscale structures. And then the third breakthrough I want to talk about is the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. Um, and then this kind of accelerates what the neural network can do even more. The idea here is that you set up your machine learning algorithm, your network, uh, in competition with the supply of data. And they kind of co-evolve in this kind of fight, an arms race. So you have some data, the network learns to classify it, then you evolve the data to make it harder, and then the network evolves to be even more sophisticated. And if you keep doing this, you get much more rapid improvement of the classifications that your network can do. Um, for some strange reason, one of the main applications computer scientists put this to was in generating artificial human faces. So all those people up there don't exist. These are faces that have been synthesized using generative adversarial networks. Um, and you, there's a web page where you can go and download the face of the day that doesn't exist. Um, but it's such a powerful idea that very soon scientists got hold of this. Now here's a a recent paper from last year, uh, actually application to particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider um, to improve the classification that you have on these 3D particle showers. 
And then this general idea of co-evolving your artificial intelligence technology with the problem uh, is also just a very good idea in general outside of the area of networks. Uh, and it's now also being used in how to design new experiments. So we want experiments that are going to discover new things, new physics. Um, and so if you can co-evolve the experimental design with what you kind of already know or suspect, then that's very powerful. So now we come to where we are today uh, and the Alan Turing Institute, where I work. And I'll say a little bit about our role in bringing these methods of data science and AI into science. So it was founded, um, it was started in 2014 for funding and it started in 2015 operating. And it's the UK's National Institute for Research in Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. Uh, it's a network of industry, government, universities, and it's based in the British Library in London. And one of the programs that we started just last year is the Data Science for Science program, which aims to ensure that research across the science and humanities can benefit from these methods in AI and data science. So this is the program that I'm running. Uh, and I'm now just going to give you some highlights of some of the projects that we've already got going in the last few months, or things that we're thinking about. Um, so the first one, the, um, the funny spongy type objects you can see there are these tail filaments. These are kinds of proteins. Uh, and these come out of uh, patients who have Alzheimer's disease. And, and it's very critical that we understand the 3D structure of these things. It's a very complicated thing. You generate lots of data when you're taking scans of these patients. Uh, and so being able to incorporate our knowledge about how proteins fold into the machine learning algorithm enables us to do a much better job of determining their structure. Work with the John Innes Center is looking at plant biology. Um, plants are really, really good at synthesizing highly complex chemicals, many of which are very useful, like they're good for anti-malarial drugs or anti-cancer drugs. But because the chemistry is so complicated, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for humans to be able to work it out and do it by hand on paper. So again, machine learning methods from AI are helping the scientists there at the Johnny and Center to do this much more effectively. Um, this is from an experiment at the Diamond Light Source at Harwell, and what you're seeing uh, is, well, it's a reconstruction from the data of metals crystallizing as an alloy is being formed uh, under various magnetic fields. And you can imagine the amount of data that gets produced just to generate this single uh, video is, is absolutely incredible. They're really looking at high resolution in determining this crystalline structure. Something a bit different. We're working with the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, they have satellite images uh, taken basically daily. And we're trying to work out when icebergs are going to carve, where they go, when they split up, when they melt. And as you can imagine, this is very important in understanding the effects of climate change and global warming. Uh, we're also doing work detecting, trying to count the number of seals that there are based on satellite images. Now, something very different. One of our fellows is working with the National Gallery on looking at oil paintings. Um, it turns out that lots of artists, because probably because they couldn't afford new canvas, they used to paint over old pictures. Um, and so what we're doing is we're using X-rays or infrared imaging to try and detect those paintings that are hidden underneath other paintings. Um, but that's the kind of image you get. What you'd really like to do is completely reconstruct what the original painting was without obviously having to damage the new painting that's on top of it. Uh, the Living with Machines project works with the British Library, actually, where we're based. Um, and we're looking at the archive of newspapers from Victorian times. Uh, that's all been digitized. And we're analyzing that together with things like census data, uh, birth, death, marriage records, to try and work out the impact of the Industrial Revolution on social change. 
uh, where people moved, what their attitudes were, how their attitudes changed as a result of people working in factories and in cities and so forth. So that's uh, quite a large project that's just got going. Uh, and then this is interesting because it turns the spotlight on scientists themselves. And we're trying to analyze or see if we can detect when academics are, are being a bit naughty and doing secret deals with each other to cite each other's papers. The more citations you have, the more likely you are to get promoted and so forth. Um, in particle physics, it seems that everyone is an author on every paper, so I'm not sure it will apply in that field. Uh, but we'll see what they show. And then we've been talking to some physicists. Uh, I was talking recently to some people involved with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and also the Square Kilometer Array about the, just the amounts of data they're going to produce in their observation are incredible, how they're going to manage that, uh, and then importantly, what are going to be the work streams in order to analyze these? How on earth do you detect very rare or transient events, you know, that if you miss them, they're gone? Um, these are really interesting problems. And then also, of course, I've been talking to people associated with CERN um, about their data ana analysis problems. We'll come on to some more detail in a minute. This is a graph of how much data CERN has stored on tape uh, over the last nine years in petabytes. And if the future Hadron Collider gets going, of course, this is only going to get much, much bigger. So there are issues not only just on the management of this, but how do you get the most out of it? You're storing all this stuff. It's one thing to do an experiment and say, oh, look, we discovered this thing. But you're storing all this stuff. That has a huge cost. There's an environmental impact. What are you going to do with it to make the most out of the data that you've been storing? OK, so what, what of the future? This is, uh, this is a quote from one of my favorite songs, uh, Donald Fagan sings about a future where machines make all our big decisions, perhaps do our science. They're programmed by nice people like me with, with compassion and vision, so you don't have to worry. The world will be a beautiful place where you can take it easy. Um, it's not quite clear whether that's a beautiful vision or a scary vision or perhaps just a boring vision. Um, I think we've still got a long way to go before AI machines can do all our science for us, uh, and I want to highlight a few of the challenges that we have. The first one is the way in which we do the analysis of data from experiments. The, the top of this is kind of the traditional workflow, if you like. You've done your experiment, you've got lots and lots of data, you feed it into your algorithm, and you get out, what, some classifications, some statistical trends, and so forth. What we'd like to move to is being able to incorporate our knowledge, our theory, and our understanding into the algorithms so that we actually produce new insights, new discoveries, and new concepts. Um, what's interesting to me is that in the discovery of the attempt to discover dark matter, that's kind of working the other way. Physicists now haven't got any good theories, uh, and this is a really new territory for them. Another big challenge is not just the amount of data, but the speed with which it's produced. Uh, already in LHC, for some experiments, we're having to throw away almost all of the data as it comes off because we can't deal with it. So then there's questions about how on earth you decide what to keep and what to throw away. How much does that impact on how you might be able to reuse that data later? Uh, think back to the, the paranormal thing. If you've collected data in different experiments and filtered them under different assumptions, how is that going to affect anyone who tries to put that data together to do more research? So that's a big problem. Uh, and in fact, it takes us to some perhaps surprisingly practical applications of what philosophers traditionally have looked at. These are the covers of first editions by Mill, Hume, and Kant. Uh, and they were interested in how is it that people do know and understand stuff based just on their experiences, their observations? And how is it that uh, our current theories and assumptions bias what it is that we then make of those assumptions to produce new knowledge? Um, the traditional way in which science is supposed to proceed, or an ideal way, is maybe you've done some observations, you come up with a theory, and then you do a whole new set of experiments that are supposed to test that theory. 
Now, if that new set of experiments is very expensive, or you have to wait two years to get your experiment scheduled, um, or it just doesn't get run at all, then what are you going to do? Can you reuse the data from other experiments? Is that allowed? Are you allowed to look again at the data that you did before and tweak your theory a bit? Uh, that's a real challenge, but if we're going to make the most out of all this data that we're storing, we need to solve it. Um, and there's a really interesting paper that came out recently by some researchers at Google and Microsoft on exactly that. Um, and the idea here is that if we write algorithms in the right kind of way, and we sample our stored data in the right kind of way, then you can have a methodology where you can kind of validly reuse your data and keep looking at it again and still get kind of statistically valid results. So guaranteed fresh results, even from old data. Uh, and as we're getting more and more data, then I think that's going to be a very important kind of line of research to pursue. I'm going to finish with a quote from a famous physicist. Uh, I assume he said it. I found it on the internet. It says, any fool can know the point is to understand. Uh, if he was alive today, maybe he would have said, any fool can collect data, the point is to understand. Um, what's interesting is that's not quite right. It's actually, as we've heard from the earlier talks, a huge intellectual and engineering challenge just to collect the data. And we put an awful lot of our resources into doing that. But we should never forget that the whole point of doing that is to eventually understand. I think these methods from artificial intelligence and data science can certainly help with the data analysis. Whether they can help with the understanding and discovery, I think, is an important but perhaps still open question. So, thank you very much. <laughs>